It's now 100 years since the end of the First World War, a conflict that claimed the lives of over three quarters of a million British men. Now, featuring rare and previously unseen personal testimony, alongside newly restored archive film, this groundbreaking three-part series will tell the story of the Great War as never before. From the suffering and sacrifice experienced by the men on the front line. The corpses there, they all had rat's nests in the cage of the chest. And when you disturbed them, the rats ran out of the chest. You can't forget a thing like that. To the dramatic change in women's lives on the home front. I felt when I was working on munitions, I really thought, well, I haven't got any brothers to go and fight. I'm doing the next best thing. And I was quite pleased to be able to do it. In this film, we'll hear from those who survived the horrors of the Somme. We met, ooh, a hurricane of bullets. They actually, they whizzed by my ears, you know, ping, 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 flying by, by my ears like that. And from those who were left with physical and mental scars. They amputated my foot through the ankle. I made no bones about it. I really cried my eyes out when I saw the results. This is the story of the tragedy and turmoil of Britain's Great War. In 1916, after more than a year of stalemate on the Western Front, Allied commanders planned a major new offensive against the German army. It would take place along a 16-mile stretch of the River Somme, and, if all went according to plan, result in a decisive victory. It was supposed to be a joint offensive with France, but in February, the Germans attacked the city of Verdun, over 150 miles away and many French divisions were diverted there, where they would suffer enormous casualties. As a result, the main responsibility for the Somme offensive fell to the British. Led by new commander-in-chief, Sir Douglas Haig, they were so confident of victory, they allowed film cameras to record the event. They would capture one of the most infamous and costly battles of the entire war. People said that Haig was wrong in making us go and fight the enemy. Damn it, we couldn't sit there forever. You got to get on with the job. Uh, the French had been badly, very nearly knocked out, and we got to go get on with the job and kill the, kill the Germans. You know, do as we were told by our senior officers and do our best to prevent this country being taken over by some enemy. Well, we wanted to fight the Germans anyway. Blinking old Kaiser and his son, we used to hate them people. You're only young, you see what I mean? You're young and you, you're full of excitement, I suppose. All together now, it's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. A good goodbye, Piccadilly. 
Farewell, Lester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. <laughs> Arriving at the front were the latest recruits to Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener's volunteer army, which by then numbered around two and a half million men. Many were in one of the new so-called PALS battalions, made up of volunteers from the same town, village or workplace. Young people like myself are saying, we'll show those Germans, we'll push them back home. It was just the thoughts of really young men who didn't know any better. Others had lied about their age to be there. I was 16, but I said I was 18. I told them I was 18, but I was only 16. So patriotic, that's why. It was just so patriotic. That was our feeling those days. And I was went to the Battle of the Somme. So that's where I was sent to, the Battle of the Somme, and uh, to a place called Feet Thou. Some of Kitchener's recruits preparing for battle on the Somme already knew what it was like to go over the top. Having fought at Luce in 1915, where 16,000 men were killed in two weeks of fighting. I thought to myself, when we went on the Somme, I thought, oh, well, never mind. If my time comes, I don't want to stop with a bullet. That's <laughs> off it sudden. If I've got to go, I've got to go. It's off it sudden. That's the way I look it. And I never, I always dreaded losing an arm or a leg. Well, we knew what we were in for. We were there to do a job. We couldn't get out of it, we did. We were told to do a job and we did it. I might have been afraid, I expect. I was afraid the second time. Yes, no doubt about it. We were afraid to. Young fellows, 18, 19, mar married men with a couple of kids going over the top like that, and they're crying their eyes out, wondering what's happening to the people at home. At home, Britain's children were having to come to terms with the fact that their fathers were away fighting. But their pride in having seen their dad in uniform before he left was a memory that gave comfort to some. I can remember Mum took us out for the day to Dover Castle, and we were so thrilled about it because we could look out of some slits in the wall and, uh, right, and we were told to look across and we could see France there. And then, um, of course, we had to see Dad drilling the men. We were naturally over the moon to stand there and see our dad. But then, as a child, you would, wouldn't you think? You think your dad's the, you know, one and only. <laughs> When first I started school, my first teacher was a Mr. Brown, and uh, he was very nice. We'd all adored him because we'd never had a male teacher before. We'd always been female teachers, you know? So we were thrilled to bits. And the first day he went through the register, he was going through all the names, and he says, oh, we have a mod. Come into the garden, 
he said, stand up, Maud. So I stood up and he crooked his finger to come here and he says, I'm a singer, you know, and that's my favourite song, Come Into The Garden, Maud. And he says, you're the first one I've ever come across that had that name. So he says, that'll be our song, won't it? And, oh, of course, I was thrilled to bits. And uh, every time he wanted me to come out, he used to sing, come into the garden, Maud. And, of course, after <laughs> and then the next thing, he was called up and he went away. On the 24th of June, 1916, the Allies launched a massive artillery bombardment on the Somme in an attempt to destroy German defences. In seven days, over a million and a half shells were fired at the enemy lines. We were all convinced that this was the push which was to, which was to end the war. We were certainly very impressed with the thunder of the guns because it started all at once. And uh, terrific. And it went on and on and on. Thunder, thunder, thunder. With a practice year, you could pick out the individual types of gun firing. Well, at times it's indescribable. You might get about 12 guns, uh, battery, I don't know what they call them there, till they're all firing at the same time. Another time it would be one after the other. Tens of thousands of shells had been sent over to the German line. And uh, the day before we were supposed to go over the top, an officer, an high-ranking officer, got on his horse and uh, said to us, tomorrow, lads, tomorrow, men, you'll go and, uh, and take the German trench. I say that because I know you'll take the trench. There's no trench there. There's no wire there. They, it'll all be pounded by our guns and you could just walk over and carry your guns as you would carry a bag. At 7.30 a.m., the men would go over the top toward the German lines. As the time approached, they made their final preparations. We moved up into the uh, front line trench. Every man was given a packet of Woodbines, stupid thing to say, but I went over smoking a number 11 of dollar. And that uh, uh, sort of overall cigarette. I don't know why, but it doesn't matter. And um, zero I was 7.30, I think it was a lovely morning, and over the top we went. They just sh shouted, come on, lads, said the sergeant. And that's, you get over the top the best you could. Well, the one next to you would be about a yard away from you, or two yards away on the other side of you. And you go straight forward in a line. You're not holding each other's arms, you just go forward. In the south, where German defences were at their weakest, the artillery bombardment was most successful and Allied infantry faced the least resistance. Actually, we had um, a very good day. The Manchesters were uh, on our right were held up, and somebody else on our left was held up, and that's why we uh, had to stop, really. Otherwise, some idiot said we were going to walk straight through to Berlin, but we couldn't. But elsewhere, the bombardment failed, and the Germans emerged from deep dugouts and waited with rifles and machine guns ready. Uh, 
I was one of the first to get up over on the top. We met a, ooh, a hurricane of bullets. They actually, they whizzed by my ears, you know, ping, 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 flying by, by my ears like that. We were able to see the infantry going forward. In some cases, they didn't get very far. They were just wiped out. If he were quick enough to drop down where the Germans open fire, the bullets would go over, over the top of me. But there was a good money wounded before they could drop. Some of the chaps were lying around, you know, arms off or in pain and so on. Some a fellow would throw, give us a fag, you know, or something. And you, but you couldn't help the poor soul. You couldn't help him at all. Tommy Gay had gone over the top together with his best friend. From the time we went up over the top, went over together, sort of thing, I never saw him anymore. No, I never saw my... His name was Johnny Jump. Yes. Never saw him anymore. Must have had one, the bullet right away. Yeah. The British suffered over 57,000 casualties that day, including over 19,000 men killed. It remains the most costly day in the history of the British Army. They were just put down on stretchers, pieces of fencing, pieces of wood, just put down and left, and the awful stretcher bearers went to get some more. Oh, some of the men were calling for their mothers, some were calling for girlfriends or wives. It was a nasty sight. I remember once I said to one, have you got a mother and father? And he said, I haven't got a mother, she's dead. But I say, said to him, well, you'll be with her in a few minutes, so don't worry. And that was all I said to him. There wasn't anything else to say. How can you describe seeing a mere handful of men come where you whether you you were used to seeing a seeing a battalion And we weren't the only ones who felt sick. The colonels were sitting in front of what was left of their men, sobbing. There were so few, so few men left. I was the, must have been the luckiest man on earth. But to, to walk over the front with all that machine gun fire and not one of those bullets got my name on it. I must be the luckiest man on earth. Absolutely the luckiest man in the world. The first day of the Battle of the Somme was a national tragedy. 
but it was only the beginning of a long and bloody struggle, as along the battlefront, most of the Allied objectives still lay in German hands. Joining those already at the front were more of Kitchener's volunteer army, among them many inexperienced young officers who would soon be leading their men over the top. When I was 19, uh, I was posted to France and there had been tremendous casualties and I was obviously a replacement. An officer uh, in my time, a second lieutenant in my time, his term of fighting was no more than six weeks. Six weeks was the, was the limit before he was killed or wounded. The casualties, they were enormous. It was all very sad, but uh, uh, there was a hell of a war going on and you've got to get on with it. And you went there uh, despite you might be wounded or killed at any moment yourself. The Hun was throwing things at you all day long, all night long, very often. And I don't think you gave it very much thought. Throughout the summer of 1916, Allied forces on the Somme went over the top time and again as they fought for the objectives they'd previously failed to take. First of all, you're looking at your watch and you, to see zero hour. And then you look and see that your men, the men you're going to go over the top with, are left and right, are equipped and ready to go. And then you, you encourage them, right and left, to go with you, all go together. So you sort of shepherded them over as well as you could. And that's, that's the only description I could give you. You were a shepherd. <laughs> there it is. You want ambition is to get to the German wire safe and sound. Get there before the Germans get you. <laughs> we knew we had to go over and shift jury out of his trench. We had that order. Aye. Sergeant was shot, get on, get on. Aye. You go down. You'd uh, get in the back of a bloody thistle if you for shelter. If you... <laughs> Aye. you went out and, and you saw men dropping right and left. If you knew them as as you would, you you felt for them very much. Very much. As you went over, sort of climbing barbed wire, my clothes were all ripped up like rags, sort of thing. Climbing barbed wire here, barbed wire there, you know? And then, what did I say? Well, I was in a hell of a state, but just in rags, I was in rags. The advantage were always there to be used, if necessary. When I say if necessary, that was it. what I meant to say, if you got close enough to use them. I'll tell you something, and all, about being at fighting. There's more lads put bullets into the enemy instead of the bayonet. And we weren't supposed to do that, you know. 
<laughs> it's either him or thou. And he was standing solid where thou was on the move. Aye, and thou just pulled the trigger and down he would go. It made you never forget it. Never. And I even to this day. Just to think you you shot a man, you know, for and do nothing at you. That was how I used to always look at it. And then again he was say, uh, Well, if I don't get him, he'll get me, and my life is worth a hell of a lot to me. <laughs> That's how we were on, young and daft. Hey. On the Somme, what was supposed to have been a swift and decisive victory had turned into a brutal battle of attrition. Life was cheap, two penny. It didn't matter how many men were killed or wounded, as long as they attained uh, a German trench, which inevitably, and it happened many a time, we held it for half a dozen hours till they came back at us about twice or three times and drove us back to where we originally started. We were sent away again over the top for the third time in succession, you know, in succession. And of course, our object then was to take the town of Guillemont. When we got there, the Germans had retired a little bit, and one of them came along and I do it on his own, one German on his own, and come back, and there was half a dozen of us lads hiding in a shell hole. We were in a shell hole, huddled together, to, to, so we shouldn't be seen much, and the, when the German come up to me, and he almost stabbed me, you know? He was a good mind to do me in. He got his bayonet on the end of his rifle and nearly stuck it into me, but it touched my chest, sort of thing, but he never stabbed me. And of course I went cold, naturally. But then he didn't stab me. He took us, the four or five of us, out of the shadow and put us in a compound behind the German mine. But that was a bad feeling, a very bad feeling, <laughs> yeah. The Allies captured the village of Guillemont on the 6th of September, 1916. The Battle of the Somme had entered its third month. Keep the hope fires burning, though your heart is yearning. When the lads are far away, they dream of home. There's a silver lining through the dark clouds shining. Keep the dark clouds right away till the boys come home. <laughs> we hoped, we, we wanted a blighty wound as much as anything, we, we got to that stage that if we if we got a blighty wound, uh, blighty is an Indian word, as you probably know, uh, home, blighty being a home, the best we could hope for was a wound that would take us home. All my life I've had hunches 
and they've come true. And I said to my friend, what a nice morning for a cushy blighty and home. I have no earthly idea what came down or how it came down, but I just had one stiffening burn. And I went like a poker. And when I came to, I noticed that I was hit behind the heel, which took the sole clean away. The doctors had a look at me, and I said that I did not want to lose my foot, if possible. But it was hopeless. The foot had to go, and that was that. They put me on a, a table with a mattress. I think it was in the kitchen that they did it. And uh, at last, let me say, they, they, I had the the chloroform in those days, and it was done. I was born to it by somebody who knew that if, when you go the first time into the theatre, so many nurses who go out to attend their first operation will faint when the first impression, first incision is made. But if you make a point of looking over there, when they're doing the incision there, and then turn your head afterwards. If you don't see the first incision made, you're all right. But if you see the blood oozing out, you're done for. And I found that worked beautifully. I've never fainted in the theater years. They amputated my foot through the, through the ankle. And, uh, and I can assure you that was no easy job. And I was, it was extremely painful. I can assure you, if I ever howled in my life when I came out, I howled in. I made no bones about it. I really cried my eyes out when I saw the result. Jock was sent back to Britain where amputees and other wounded men were becoming a common sight on the streets. For those sent home for treatment or convalescence, there was often a chance of reconciliation with loved ones, even if only temporary. In 1916, my dad was wounded. I don't know how, but um, came home on leave. And uh, I remember him sitting there and, and uh, making a fuss of me <laughs> and uh, singing. I had a, a gramophone with a blooming great big horn, blue, and he put this record on and uh, then he was uh, singing to me. And when I told them how beautiful you are, <laughs> they'll never believe me, that from this great big world you've chosen me. You know, it's, to me, that was absolutely wonderful. I don't know how long he was home, but it was lovely having him home because uh, he went back again. As autumn approached, British casualties on the Somme totaled around 200,000 men. Progress remained slow but the army was about to unleash a secret weapon that would help to change the course of the battle. I was out in a trench out there with some others, and I could hear a, a purr, purr going on. And I thought, what's that noise? It's getting louder and louder, and I stood on the fire step, and I could see something moving. 
was like what we call in Scotland a steamroad roller with a big funnel on and big heavy thing. And I said, look, and they all started looking. Some got up in the parapet. And we could see these things moving. And behind them, there were probably four or five or six soldiers running behind with their bayonets fixed. An armored crawler, that's what I call them. Of course, when we got in them and got moving around with them, oh, uh, well, we knew exactly what, what they were for. And the armaments, when we got inside, we saw the armaments. We said, well, this is, this is really it. We never deviated the tanks for anything. We had to go over previous dead and dead that you'd killed. If they fell in your way, you had to go over. All feelings of humanity leaves you when you're fighting. You say to yourself, well, it's either him or me. See? So I got to get in first. That's it. That's what you say. So you, you've got no feelings of humanity right then. Afterwards, yes, perhaps. Yeah. The tank was one of the most significant military advances of the war. But there were advances in medicine, too, including developments in blood transfusions, x-rays, and prosthetics. However, in the days before antibiotics, many wounds became infected as bullets and shrapnel carried the filth of the battlefields into the body, leading to gangrene, amputation, and death. Oh, the smell of gangrene. That's a thing you never forget. A terrible smell. I think anybody who's ever smelt it would do that. You get it so quickly when there's a lot of infection about it. When I heard them mention gangrene, I was terrified. They took my leg off from the ankle to four, six inches below the knee. And that was a big one. And I can assure it was sore, very sore. And I felt it. And I, once again, I did a hell of a lot of crying. Good, hefty stuff. Dressing time was an ordeal at all times. The bandages that I had on had dried and they had to be pulled away and and much of the, the dressing adhered to the skin throughout his ordeal the woman responsible for jock's care was known to him only as nurse sutherland she was my nurse and she certainly looked after me in every way. It wasn't a case of attraction or anything. It was a case she was good at her job. Very good at her job. She never spoke hardly except words of comfort. And I did nothing else but cry. And being a soldier and being 20 or 21, I didn't want to be more or less a child and cry down. But cry, I did, and plenty of it. Back on the Somme, 
the first tanks went into action on the 15th of September 1916, during the Battle of Flair, Corselette. Although the early models were prone to mechanical failure, and the army was unsure how best to use them, they still took the Germans completely by surprise. They'd never seen anything like it before. But when they, when they saw we was armed with uh, small guns and machine guns, they gave up right away. It's surprising. We, we hadn't time to get on top of the trench before they was out with their arms up. Yeah. And uh, we passed them over to the infantry and take back to uh, base. And the rest, we, we could see some of the machine gunners had got away and we could see them silhouetted against the skyline with the machine guns on their shoulders going like hell back to the second and third lines. We did a job that the infantry had been trying to do for two years, and they'd lost hundreds of thousands trying to do it and couldn't. And we did it in half an hour. So, you see? With the help of the tank, the Battle of the Somme finally ended on the 18th of November, 1916, when the Allies captured the village of Beaumont Hamel. In four and a half months of fighting, British and Empire casualties totaled almost 420,000 men. They'd advanced just six miles but they dealt a devastating blow to the German army. But for some, the horrors weren't over yet. I arrived at Beaumont Hamel. Then I was told to bury, to collect the newly killed dead, which I did. I, I took it, it was stretcher bearers. Uh, unfortunately, the stretcher bearers, a number of them, they were related to the ones who were dead. And uh, it was a bit upsetting. Then I was told to go back into the no man's land, <coughs> or rather what was no man's land, and bury the old dead. That is, the dead, of the Newfoundland Regiment, who had been killed there on July the 1st. The first one I saw, the first one I came across, with his hair growing, hair growing out of his, still growing from his face. When I touched it, the rats ran out. There was nothing left under the putty except a bone. It seemed to me such a terrible waste of life. After all they'd been through, many of those who fought at the Somme remained traumatized by their experiences. It, it, it affects the nerves. The noise and everything, it, it gradually affects the nerves. And if you're a nervous person or your nerves are anyways bad at all, it's going to affect you. It makes you feel bad in yourself, real bad. You, 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 you begin to do like this. And I never did that before. And I couldn't, couldn't believe myself at the time. I couldn't believe it. That I, I thought my nerves would, would carry me, but no, it broke my nerve. Cases of shell shock were identified as early as 1914, 
and ranged in their severity. At the Battle of the Somme, as many as 40% of all casualties were also suffering from some form of the condition. We were on the Somme for the whole of the, the, the time. You couldn't help being a bit frightened, I think, but you, you, you couldn't show it. You've got to bottle it up. That's why I put a great strain on one's nervous system. I was troubled for a good many years by a, a difficulty in speaking. It was hardly a stammer. It was a stuttering. But I didn't sleep till three and four o'clock in the morning and used to go up through the ceiling and down again until little bit. But that was the after effect of being shelled for 19 months and so on. While some bore mental scars, others were left to deal with life-changing physical injuries. To the public, they were heroes. Now, if we went out with the, some of the boys, about a dozen of the boys, wounded boys, we all went in a bus and we went into the movies. We got in for nothing. You were always a bit of a, uh, <laughs> what do you call, an eye catcher. They would always stop in the street and look at you, or some people would come up and talk to you. And then you sometimes you get packets of cigarettes or chocolates or things like that. While he was recuperating, Jock heard news of the woman who looked after him, Nurse Sutherland. She was, I think she was retiring. So I wrote her and, uh, and I said, I'd, I'd come, I'd get, I'd get, if I'm coming down with my friend, we couldn't down, we'd call her and see her. But uh, about a week before we were due to leave, I had a, a letter saying that she had died. I don't know the cause or anything. But she, she did, she eventually died. I miss her a lot. In Fifeshire, schoolgirl Maud Cox was waiting for news from her favourite teacher, Mr Brown. They used to send postcards to the school, you know, to say where he was and where he was getting on. And then one day, the headmaster, Mr. Christie, he, the whole rang, bell rang, and we all had to go into the assembly hall, you know, and he put a big map on the board and he told us, he says, now our Mr. Brown and the fiancés of Miss Jessie and Miss Jean MacLeod, they'd all been killed at a place called the Somme in France, and he pointed it out on the map and put a cross on it. And... Uh, he said, no, I want you all to say the prayer uh, for the dead and then we'll sing the first verse, Oh God, our help in ages past, and I want you all to walk very quietly home. But I didn't go quietly home. I rushed home, crying all the road, and uh, uh, Mother said, what was wrong? I said, Mr Brown's been, co been killed. He'll never sing, come into the garden mode anymore. <laughs> and also was comforting me, she says, but he's not the only one, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I took a long while to be comforted because <laughs> he was such a nice man. Come into the garden mode for the black bat night has
And as I pointed out to a priest once, a Catholic priest, he was talking about hell. I says, don't talk to me about hell, Father. I says, I've been through hell once. I don't want to go through it again. In the sitting room, Mum had this great big picture on the wall of Dad in his uniform, head and shoulders, and she just turned it round the other way, probably because um, it upset her to see it every time she went in the room, you see. <laughs> 